Good evening to you. My name is Regan Devines and thank you for being here with us on From the South. Before we begin, here are the headlines. Argentina's president Macri reduces the spending power of the country's civilians. Allegations of opposition vote buying prompt an investigation by the Venezuelan government. And an Israeli ultra-nationalist group tries to stop European foreign funding of NGOs in Israel with a controversial video. The details on these stories and others now. As expected, the Argentine peso has plunged in value as the new pro-business government of Mauricio Macri scrapped the foreign exchange restrictions imposed by the leftist predecessors. As a consequence, the US dollar has surged more than 40%. At the start of trading on Thursday, a dollar was changed for 15 pesos, which is more than 52% higher than Wednesday's closing rate. Although it later eased back to 14 pesos, it was still more than 42% higher than at the close on Wednesday when the dollar was changing for 9.84 pesos. The protectionist measures imposed by Cristina Fernandez had propped up salaries and domestic production. Macri's opponents had warned that easing the limits on dollar transactions and the fixed exchange rate would reduce the spending power of Argentines. I went straight to ask him and he told me to wait a while longer so he can give me dollars in cash. There are no requirements, only an identity card. I want to keep them under the pillow before Monday, before January 1st. I think it's counterproductive for the economy. Lower salaries, more misery. Regarding foreign policy, foreign policy Argentina's new foreign minister, Susana Marcoro, has announced that new agreements reached with China and Russia are being examined and could be altered if deemed necessary. Marcoro has also said that although her government will continue pressing, the sovereignty claim over the Malvinas Islands will no longer dominate Argentina's relationship with the United Kingdom. The issue of the Malvinas is a historical issue. It's an issue that is established by the Constitution, and as such, we are going to maintain our claims and we are going to maintain them with the corresponding emphasis and clarity. That is to say that this is an issue without a doubt. Having said that, we also understand that the relation with Great Britain can't be reduced to just the Malvinas issue. So while we maintain a pathway for discussion on the Malvinas, we're going to maintain a pathway for discussion on the rest of the potential opportunities to work together. And human rights organizations are highly concerned after Argentina's new attorney general opened an investigation against the leader of the Mothers of Playa de Mayo, Hebe Bonafini. She's being investigated for her public remark, remarks where she called on social movements to resist neoliberal policies being implemented by Macri's government. Prosecutors want to charge her for attempting to incite violence, despite the fact that Bonafini never called for violent recourse. Venezuela's ruling Socialist Party has called for an investigation on vote buying by opposition candidates in the Amazonas state. According to the government, votes from deceased citizens were cast in the recent legislative election. There is also allegedly a video of Amazonas Interior Minister Victoria Franchi speaking to an unidentified man regarding payments for votes. The opposition has denied those accusations. Our United Socialist Party of Venezuela, the great patriotic Simon Bolivar wing, immediately requests the Republic's Attorney General take action on the issue of a violation of the Constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela for violating electoral laws, for trying to weaken the Venezuelan electoral system, and aggression towards the voting intentions of Venezuela. Venezuela is commemorating 185 years since the death of liberator Simón Bolívar. The man after whom the Bolivarian Revolution was named was born in Caracas on July 24, 1783. He is regarded as one of the most relevant figures in South America and a hero of freedom along with San Martín leading the independence of Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, Peru and of course Venezuela and his legacy of unity, independence, integration, and anti-colonialism remains alive across Latin America today. 
Simon Bolivar died in Santa Marta, Colombia on December 17, 1830. Brazil's Supreme Court has ruled that the Senate has autonomy to reject the impeachment demand against President Dilma Rousseff. It opposes Judge Edson Fachin's admission on Wednesday of the legitimacy of a secret ballot last week. The court ruled over four controversial points. Two of them invalidate the process initiated by Congress President Eduardo Cunha. Only, partly, only party leaders will be allowed to form the special commission of the House and the vote to elect them cannot be secret. Regarding Rousseff's request for her defense, the court stated there is no need for a defense at, the current stage of, at this current stage of the process. The first vote will need a simple majority, but the second must be a two-thirds majority. This will be approved on, um, approved, on, approved on Friday in this year's last session. And the Brazilian Congress has passed the national budget bill for next year, preserving a popular welfare social program known as Bolsa Familia, made possible by reducing the fiscal savings target. The Congress voted for a fixed target of 0.5% of gross domestic product without the option of, deducing, of deducting investments and other expenditures. It rejected a request made by President Dilma Rousseff on Tuesday to reduce the target to zero if needed, meaning no savings. Chat program WhatsApp returned to Brazil after a 13-hour interruption ruled by a Sao Paulo judge. The suspension that was due to last until Saturday came after the company failed to comply with two, two judicial rulings to share information in a criminal case involving a drug trafficker linked to one of Sao Paulo's most dangerous criminal gangs, the PCC, or First Command of the Capital. The trafficker allegedly used WhatsApp services while, com while committing crimes. 100 million users are estimated to use WhatsApp in Brazil. It's been a long time since I've seen people talking to each other so much. On the bus, in the subway, people discuss this. The lack of WhatsApp, they speak together again. It's strange. I believe an urban anthropologist could find it interesting. One year after the United States and Cuba began bilateral talks to normalize diplomatic relations, the two have announced an agreement to open commercial flight routes between the two countries. However, this does not lift the U.S. ban on general tourism to the Caribbean island. U.S. travelers still must meet at least one of 12 criteria to visit, such as being Cuban-American or partaking in educational tours or journalistic activity. Meanwhile, in Chile, a two-day strike by the civil aeronautics is provoking numerous flight cancel cancellations and delays. Some 3,000 workers joined the strike, but air traffic controllers decided to stay away. According to the Defense Ministry, 14 of 18 international flights had taken off at 8 a.m., as well as 10 of 15 domestic flights. LATAM, the biggest Latin American airline, advised its passengers to be at the airport at least four hours in advance. The Defense Ministry has decided to replace the strikers with military personnel. The remains of some 29 people that were disappeared in the Colombian conflict have been delivered to their relatives to receive proper burial. The victims were guerrilla militants and civilians, and some others were victims of the army. The burial took place at a private ceremony in Via Vicencio, the capital of the Meta Department. It's part of the agreement reached by the government and the FARC on searching for the disappeared. Here is what's coming up. A nationalist Israeli group launches a campaign to stop European funding of NGOs in Israel. This story and more next.
Caracas, Havana, Mexico, Quito, Washington, wherever the newsmakers will be there. From watch on telesurtv.net slash English, Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. Rod Stars, G1, and Claudia De La Cruz are Rebel Diaz, hip-hop activists positioned within a history of political resistance through music. And you don't stop. They invite young people to express themselves about their social struggles. And you don't stop. Watch it on telesurtv.net slash English. Tell us, sir, wherever the news, you'll be there. From London, an interpretation of current world politics as presented by the activist, writer, and historian Tariq Ali. The emergence of the United States as a global empire. The world today. Only on telesurtv.net in English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. A radical Zionist group in Israel called Imtur Zoo is claiming that NGOs there are supporting Palestinians involved in terrorism. The ultra-nationalist group posted a video online entitled The Foreign Agents Revealed. It portrays a Palestinian man with a knife lunging at the camera. The group says that it's a legitimate campaign aimed at stopping what they call a European colonialist intervention with Israel's internal affairs. They accuse leading human rights organizations of being foreign agents funded by Europe. Israeli authorities and international rights groups have called for the country's attorney general to investigate the video's producers for incitement. Some Israeli human rights groups believe that the government is involved. The issues that are in effect here are much bigger than this specific video. The video perhaps is in the, the voice of Imtirtsu, those that produced it, but the hands are the hands of the government. Palestinians urge the UN to pressure Israel to return the Palestinian bodies of those killed during the uprising that began in October. More on this with Telesurus No Harzi. The Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine organized Tuesday morning a march under the banner Retrieving Palestinian Bodies is the Most Basic of Rights in commemoration of the 67th anniversary of the International Human Rights Day. Dozens of outraged protesters and leaders of the Palestinian factions took part in the march, which began at the Haider Square and advanced towards the United Nations headquarters in Western Gaza City. We want to deliver a message to the United Nations that withholding the Palestinian bodies is a clear violation of the international law and human rights. The United Nations should put pressure on Israel to return the bodies to their families. It should also also judge Israel over this war crime and stop its biased policies. The marchers argued UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the international community to force Israel to return the bodies of 51 Palestinians who were murdered by Israeli security forces in different incidents since violence broke out across the Palestinian territories last October. Israeli sources revealed that Tel Aviv is examining a proposal for burying the Palestinian bodies in one of Israel's cemeteries of numbers, which are closed military areas that neither the relatives of the killed or the human rights activists can access, in clear violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Nuhar Zintrisu TV, Gaza. Reports are that heavy clashes have resulted in the deaths of 12 pro-government fighters and 30 injuries in Yemen just days after a ceasefire was announced. Loyalist forces stormed the military base that was controlled by insurgents, accusing them of firing at pro-government troops. And the rebels accused the loyalists of attacking their positions in Mareb and Shishanah. Meanwhile, Yemen pro-government forces and rebels have completed an exchange of hundreds of prisoners. To Turkey now, students with their faces masks engaged in clashes with police forces during a protest of solidarity with the Kurdish people. They carried banners reading, Kurdish people are not alone. The fighting between Kurdish security forces and the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, and their supporters has escalated in recent months, leading the government to impose several curfews over the southeast of Turkey.
European Union leaders settled in for a long night of talk set to focus on the refugee crisis as well as Britain's future in the bloc. British Prime Minister David Cameron said he hopes the talks will provide real progress towards a deal on better membership teams for his country. However, a number of leaders present have already said no to Cameron's proposals, calling the ones on the refugee crisis discriminatory. The British President wants refugees to wait four years before claiming in work benefits in Britain. Friday's talks about the Syrian crisis is an important one, yet will represent the latest in a series of what some believe are failed discussions in ending the war. Meanwhile, Syrian civilians are the ones who continue to suffer most, which has left many of them highly skeptical of the outcome. Telesur Hazem Abdullah has more. The whole world awaits the New York conference about the Syrian conflict between Russia and the U.S. to be held this Friday. But between the hum of bullets and the noise of conferences, Syrians see that five years the crisis have passed, teaching them one thing only, and is not to look to any conference as the event which will end what they passed over the past years. Honestly, I hope there will be positive results, but unfortunately, many conferences have been held, many negotiations, and all have failed or been thwarted. And though we do not count on any conference, but rather on our will, we are here to stay and we will resist side by side. On the ground, the Syrian army, supported by Russian jets, has achieved new progress in controlling several mountains areas bordering Turkey and northwestern Syria. For that, the Syrian army brought life again to the Aquarius Air Base, which will impact positively on the military operations in the Aleppo province in the north. We are strong because of our national army, the Syrian Arab Army, which protects us. And you can see the capital and other cities are safe. That's after more than four years of crisis and war against terrorism, and after all the economic pressures and others. The military map changes daily. And it seems that the strengths stand with the Syrian army and its allies, as Istanguta in the capital Damascus has seen a significant development where the Syrian army has regained full control of the air base of Marjus Sultan and has hit the terrorist position on the southern border with Jordan. Hazem Abdullah, Tirisu, Syria. Here now is a brief look at other news stories around the world. Christine Lagarde, the International Monetary Fund chief, will face a court in France for negligence. When she was France's finance minister, she paid a compensation award to someone for the sale of a firm to the amount of $438 million. Lagarde denied the charge, saying that in this affair she always acted in the interest of the state and in respect of the law. The spiraling violence in Burundi is being blamed on President Nkurunziza's pursuit and re-election for a third term in office. The UN believes the country is on the brink of civil war between supporters of the president and those who believe his presence in office is unconstitutional. The time for piecemeal responses and fiddling around the edges is over. The situation in Burundi demands a robust, decisive response from the international community. I called last month on the Security Council to consider all possible steps to stop the ongoing violence and prevent a regional conflict, including travel bans and asset freezes. Today, those calls are more relevant than ever. And a new data transmission technology is being tested across Estonia. It's called LiFi and is able to transmit data 100 times faster than Wi-Fi. Founders say it should also make internet usage more secure and with less interference between devices. Suspended FIFA president Sepp Blatter appeared at a hearing at the football body's headquarters in Zurich. He said that he is innocent of the charge of approving a payment of about $2 million from FIFA to Misha Platini back in 2011. The verdict on Blatter's future is expected early next week, which would see him banned from football for life. His 90-day suspension had begun back in October after he was charged by the very ethics committee that he created. Yeah. 
And finally this evening, it's over 40 feet long with a terrifying jaw and its name is Tristan. We're talking about the skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex that is now on display in Berlin's Natural History Museum in Germany. Tristan is over 66 million years old and is considered one of the most complete ones among the 50 odd sets of T-Rex skeletons that remain in the world. The beast is on loan for three years from a Danish businessman who named it after his son. You can join us on Facebook, Instagram and on Twitter for more on these and other stories. Also for more extensive coverage on developing stories, please visit our website, telesultv.net slash English. For Telesult English, I'm Regan Evans. Have a good evening. Bye.